All right, so good evening, guys. Uh, today, we are very excited to invite Dexter to give us a talk. So uh, a short introduction. Dexter is actually an incoming NUS student, but he has worked on several projects. And today, he's here to share his journey in building uh, his project called Home Row. So let's invite Dexter. Hello. Uh, right, before I start, right, can I get a show of hands? How many of you have like listed a project on your resume when you're applying for an internship? Right. Oh, okay. I expected more, but uh, how, uh, okay. So like you guys have definitely worked on uh, projects before, right? Like, uh, either it's like personal or for a school project or like, I don't know, orbital or even for hack and roll, like hackathons. So, um, but I'm willing to bet that your projects most likely don't have any users and have not made any money before, right? Um, and, but, but, but it's not to say that your projects are shitty or bad. Um, I've seen some really great projects that come out of like hack and roll or like orbital, um, but the reason it does not have any users or have made any money is because that's not the goal that you had when you started the project, right? Most student projects, the goal is to help you uh, learn some interesting new technology or to showcase your engineering and design skills. Um, but what I'm here to propose is that, um, yeah, uh, is that it is possible for you to work on a project to learn all these interesting technologies. And if you perhaps like spend a bit more time, maybe creating your idea, thinking of your idea and executing a little differently, you could potentially make some money while doing it. Uh, so why should you care? Why should you make a profitable side project? Obviously the money, uh, not a lot though. Uh, like I, I make a couple hundreds, maybe like a thousand a month. Uh, but I would say uh, it definitely means a lot more to me because it's like money that I made myself directly from my users. And it's my project is kind of like my baby, right? Uh, so I'm really proud of it, uh, even though it's not a lot of money. Uh, secondly, ownership. So I didn't know how much I like control and ownership until I did like internships and stuff where I'm like working on small feature in a huge company, a huge product. Uh, so you own, if you own your app, you get to pick what you want to work on. You can pick something that's fun. You can pick what you don't want to work on and it's all up to you. So the, the freedom is really nice and learn different skills. So if you want to make a project that makes money, you can't just code all the time. You have to, uh, market your app. You have to, uh, do some customer support, uh, and you learn different skills. And if that's what you're after, then you should. Give this a shot. Um, about me, who am I? Uh, I'm Dexter. I'm currently working a eight to five office job. It's not in tech and it's really boring. Uh, I don't get to program. So after work, um, I really want to program. So I work on this Mac app called Homebrew. Uh, it, it's a Mac app I'll just share a, a bit more about later. And I'll be enrolling in NUS later this year to study computer science. So I'll see you around if you're still here. Uh, so why is home row? Uh, it yeah, it lets you navigate Mac OS with the keyboard. So a lot of programmers, they like to use their keyboard to do everything, right? Edit code. Um, so why not like browse the web, uh, use like Slack and all that with the keyboard, right? Get, yeah. Um, you usually want to do it speed and ergonomics. Uh, if you're programmers, I don't think I need to elaborate. Uh, uh, in terms of sales, I made 6,000 USD since uh, June when I started asking for money. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I'll just give you a quick demo. Uh, it's going to be a bit high. But... Can you hear me? Right, okay, so um, so like I'm in Xcode over here. So um, normally when you want to run a test, you would have to click into the test file, then you scroll down, you click here with your mouse or your trackpad. Uh, so, but with my software, what you can do is you can 
Okay, hit the shortcut so you can see a search bar appears at the bottom. Then just type what you want to click on. So I want to jump to test 5. So test 5, you can see that it's highlighted there. So I hit enter so it performs the click. Then I want to click this green button here. What I can do, I activate it again. Then you see this KP, right? So that's a dynamic shortcut. So if I don't know what I want, to, what I have to type to click there, I can just type out the dynamic shortcut. So uh, KP, you can see it's highlighted. Then I hit enter. Then it runs it. Yeah, please clap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. I started making money in 2022. I started asking for for money in 2022, but it actually started as a basically a resume padder in 2019. Uh, it was called Vimac. Uh, uh, and it was open source and free. So I, I was really afraid of monetizing and making money off it. So it was free. Um, and because it was free, right, like I didn't really have a lot of motivation to work on it. There's also COVID and an internship. So development kind of stalled in 2020 and 2021. Um, I, I've, I found my schedule finally cleared out like mid 2022. So I started development again. And now the app is called Home Row. Uh, new app icon. Uh, it, and it's closed source and paid. So completely opposite from where it started. Okay, so um, enough about me. So how do you start a side project? Uh, I'll walk you through from the idea all the way to making money. And I will give you examples of like what I did when I was making this project. So, uh, so it's not like entirely abstract and I'm not like talking out of my ass. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, the first thing is your idea. Uh, what should you work on? So a lot of student projects, um, the goal is to show off your technical abilities, your design abilities, but that, that's not what makes you money. What makes you money is uh, solving a problem that user has and solving it well enough that they're willing to pay for you. Um, so this means they don't care what um, tech stack you use, right? Like no one cares that you use uh, like the Mern stack to make your notes app or whatever. Uh, so you need to solve a problem. So what problem do you solve? But I recommend you to solve your own problems. So why? Uh, because you can, it's very easy for you to figure out what uh, features you need to add, what features you don't want to add, don't need to add. So uh, it just makes working on a project a lot easier, especially at the start, because you don't need to look for people that are not like you. Uh, you don't need to interview uh, users to get your initial prototype out. Uh, so for me, in 2019, I uh, had this semester where I was uh, I was using my trackpad to do like Figma, Photoshop, uh, Android development, and so my wrist really hurt. I don't I don't know why, but yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so a friend recommended me this Chrome extension called Vimium, which I was using at the time, and what it let you do was generate shortcuts for all the links in your browser. So I could use uh, I could browse Chrome, I could surf the web using my keyboard only, and I didn't have to use the mouse, which was what was causing like a lot of pain for me. Uh, wait, let me just play a demo. Is it playing? Yeah, so you can see, you type AF, it clicks on cat. Then JF, it clicks on that talk um, link. Cool. So naturally what I thought was, can I bring this style of navigation to all Mac apps, like throughout the entire operating system? Uh, yeah. So I went to do some Googling, right? To see if it was already made and if anyone was already looking for existing, for, for a new solution, um, because I don't want to build something that has already been built, right? So what I found was some Reddit threads, uh, some Stack Exchange posts where people were asking for Vimium for Mac, uh, and like applied OS wide. There was also a competitor, a similar product that solves the same problem, but it was discontinued and people were asking for it, any alternatives on the internet. So I knew that uh, people wanted it. So, but is this even possible? Okay. like. This was before I found out about the competitor. Uh, yeah. So I didn't know uh, 
I didn't know if it was possible. I kind of sat on this idea for a while until I had like a breakthrough at like in, at midnight or something, which was how do blind people use their Macs? And they use it, they use their Macs using screen reader software. So Mac has this screen reader called VoiceOver. Uh, and it can find all the clickable buttons on your screen and just reads it out to you, right? So you click, you, you request for the next element, it, it reads it out, then next, 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 until you found the correct one that is read to you. Then you say, you click on it. Um, and this uh, screen reader, I learned, depended on this uh, technology called accessibility. So accessibility, uh, ac yes, so apps implement accessibility, which lets you read all the information that is would be helpful for blind users. Um, so in, in a way, it's kind of like the DOM, right, in your web browser, but it's for all your apps on your desktop. Um, then I didn't, so, so I had to start giving it a try, right, to, to really know if it's possible to make my app. So I didn't know how to make Mac apps, but I, I just tried my best uh, to figure out. And this is what I had um, by day one. So yeah. So you can see that um, I was able to get the position of um, the clickable buttons on this window here and track it around. So. I knew it was actually possible. So at that point, what I had was an idea, Vimium for Vimium style navigation for the entire operating system. Uh, I knew that people were asking for it on the internet, and I knew it was technically possible. So I started to build. Okay, so the first roadblock I ran into was that I didn't know how to make Mac apps. Uh, I don't I don't know Swift. I don't know Xcode. I didn't know the accessibility API. So because I was basically a new programmer in 2019, uh, I think a lot of, I think a trap that a lot of programmers that are new, they fall into is like, should I take this, should I read this book? Should I take this course? Uh, should I fin finish this video series by this programming YouTuber? And it's easy to see why, right? Uh, because books, they have uh, lots of exercises and the author basically just like uh, hand holds you through the entire book. You can. You can finish like a 500 page book by just copying, copy pasting, unless of course there's like exercises left to the reader. Um, yeah, but th this is not reading books and doing videos, et cetera. It's not how I recommend you to learn to code um, because, yeah, wait, hold on. Maybe it's just me, but I'm really impatient. I can't sit through another book. But what, what I find the most effective is to just get started on the project, right? So what's the first problem that I had? I didn't know how to make Mac apps. So I just went to Google it. I clicked the first link. I, I went through, through the, the tutorial. Then the next, once I got the app to build, my next problem was how do I use, how do I grant accessibility API permissions? Again, back to Google, then to Stack Overflow, had to figure a bunch of stuff out. It's, it's a very frustrating process, but I think it's a much more effective way to learn to code that I recommend you to do if you're new to programming. And I mean, if you don't have any idea how to code, maybe this is not the best idea, but most of you here are probably computing students. You have taken uh, like an intro to CS course, like 101S. Uh, that's about what I had back then when I started. So I think that's more than enough. Um, yeah, so I was using accessibility API. So I, I found this docs uh, that documented how to use all the functions. But um, it, for me, right, even through today, I find a lot of docs are quite um, verbose and hard to understand. Like over here, there's this parameter type called unsafe mutable pointer. I still, I still don't know what that means. Uh, so but what I recommend instead, and what worked, really worked well for me is to actually just go on GitHub and search for the code that you want to use. So you can see all the examples here. You can just copy and paste it into your code, code base. Yeah, so after two weeks, what I had was something that kind of sort of worked. You only had one feature, it was slow, it crashed all the time, there was no app icon, and the UI was like horrible. Uh, so you can see, you activate it, then you can, it, it's the same style as Vimium. Um, yeah, so I just stole it. Mm -hmm. 
the kind of wood thing that's Yeah, so just to show how bad it was, like this is my preference page. I have no idea how I did this, like even, but yeah, it looks pretty horrible. But I was really impatient. I spent two weeks working on it. I spent two weeks working on it, like basically alone. And I didn't really share it with that many people. So I just went ahead and launched it. Uh, I think you should launch, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. I think you should launch fast. Like, don't spend too long working on your app, right? Several reasons. I have three reasons why. Um, first, don't waste your time. Uh, I think it's really sad if you spend months working on your app just to find out that no one wants it. Um, yeah. And if, if you launch a, a, a project or an app that's quite shit, but people still go on, continue to use it and give you feedback, then you know you're onto something and you know that you, you should invest more time into it, uh, which is what happened here. Uh, find your early users fast. Um, again, if you have a shitty app and you find users, you know you're onto something. And not only that, but these early users are more generally more tolerant of all the bugs in your app, and they're willing to test it out for you for free and and request features from you. They file bug reports, and it's just good, right? So you should probably make your your initial release free, or at least offer a uh, like a freemium model. So you don't scare away all your users. What? Yeah, it's not. And lastly, it's just exciting because uh, I think energy is probably your most uh, valuable currency when you're working on an app after, uh, let's say, your, your your job or after school or whatever. So you, you, you need to account for your own excitement, right? And the longer you spend working on your project without showing anyone, I think your excitement is just going to drop. So you, you would just like you, you would feel less inclined to launch the longer you spend working on it, uh, even though your app might be getting better. So when you're starting, you're full of excitement, you should launch and your users will see how excited you are, right? You will you'll feel it. Oh, okay, nice. So where to launch? Uh, I'm going to list a bunch of places you should launch in the order of um, least impactful to most impactful. Uh, but these are just generic places for you to launch. Uh, you, you should be creative, right? So if you're working on uh, an app for this specific domain, it, you should ask, is there a community or some niche forum where they hang out in and where I can share my app? So first is to your friends. Uh, yeah, like if, if, you, if you made like a day one prototype, you can share with your friends first, right? Um, then Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, so social media where people that you know are generally on and can see what you post, but generally not people outside of that circle. Then next is just the places where the entire world can see your app. So Reddit, you should probably know where it is. That uh, what it is. There's a bunch of niche subreddits out there. You can probably find one where your app fits in and belongs to. Uh, just try to be genuine when you launch there, right? Because people on Reddit they don't like salesy type of like copywriting. Oh, Hacker News. So it's quite similar to Reddit, I guess. Uh, it's, but it's generally for more technical uh, subjects. And lastly, product hunt. So this is like probably the, the biggest impact place where you can launch your app. Um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show, show you like my launch later on it. Uh, but people there generally like like salesy kind of like copywriting. Um, so yeah. So some people, they launch the app all at once into all these different platforms. Um, but I actually, I recommend you to launch your app um, basically on a ramp. So let's say you spend three days working on it, you share it with your friends, then on like Twitter or whatever, then you spend two weeks, maybe three weeks, then you put it on Reddit, then you get a bunch of users, you improve your product, then you launch on Hacker News, uh, you get feedback, you get more users, you improve your product, then you launch on Product Hunt. Uh, so each time that you launch, you get, uh, you have a better product, you have more users, and you get better at uh, doing copywriting and marketing as well. So you, you get to convert more users. Um, yep. 
Yeah, so for me, uh, after like three weeks, I launched on this subreddit called Mac Apps. Uh, and you can see the title, it's called, let me show you, ooh. Uh, it's called Vimium for Mac OS, join a beta to try it out. Probably not the best title possible, but I was like new to this whole launching thing because like this is a Mac subreddit, right? No one knows what Vimium is. And that's why I didn't do that well. Uh, yeah, also, I was also afraid of launching to, because I never done it before, I was afraid of like hate or something. So I, I put that I was 18 years old here so that people were nicer to me. It works, by the way. <laughs> uh, and feedback. So I got some positive feedback. Um, some people are confused as to what Vimium is. So I kind of learned from that. And there are definitely some haters, right? Like, why don't you open source it? Uh, like, so because we don't, I don't trust you, right? You're some random 18 year old from Singapore. <laughs> so like, why should I download your app? And I kind of gave in to that. That's why my app was like open source. So don't listen to your haters. Uh, and even though the app was shit, people were giving me feedback on like my a GitHub issues page. So they were asking to contribute. Uh, they were asking for new features, uh, reporting some bugs. So that was great. So I knew what to work on. Yeah, so now you have users. You can start improving your app based on your vision, how you see things, how you, how you want it to be, and what your users tell you. So for me, in this case, I added like things like scrolling and I, I, I did some very obvious like workflow improvements. Um, I, was, I didn't have that much of a vision at the time because I was basically copying Vimium and bringing it over to the OS, to the Mac OS. But I mean, there were some differences that I had to think through and innovate a bit. Yeah, then you launch it again. Uh, so this was like almost, almost a year later uh, when I basically wasn't developing it that much because of my internship and I wasn't motivated anymore. But I just thought like, what the heck, right? Just, just launch it on Hacker News, see what happens. And it did surprisingly well. It was like on the front page, 375 upwards. Uh, again, you, like when you launch on like Reddit and Hacker News, try to be genuine, right? So it's like, hello, I'm soon, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was open source. I think that's why it did so well because people like, people on Hacker News, they like open source stuff. And yeah. And notice that the title is no longer like Vimium for Mac OS, right? Because I had to appeal to a general programming audience that didn't know what Vimium was. So you get better as you do it more. And because it was on GitHub, um, I got a bunch of GitHub stars. Uh, three, it's at 3K now, but I think back then it was like 2K-ish. Uh, I thought it would mean a lot to me, but like once you get it, it's like the hedonic cycle, right? It doesn't mean anything to me because it's just like a number on on screen on a web page. Uh, you, you can't trade it in for money, also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I would say that uh, open source definitely has its benefits, right? Especially if you're starting out, it can boost your reputation. Uh, it can get people to use software that they otherwise wouldn't trust you to make. Um, but the, the 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 cons were that it um, I do, I wasn't making any money and it was affecting my motivation to work on the app. If you're lucky, someone might even launch the app for you. So um, in mid 2022, I was um, I found energy to work on this app again, and it was now closed sourced and paid. So it's called Homebrew now. So I put a tweet out. Uh, requesting, saying that, oh, I've stopped working on Vimac. Uh, I have this paid version with workflow improvements. If you want to buy it from me, just fill out the survey and I'll get back to you. So it was like a private, uh, I was making private sales over Twitter and email. And I had my, a website up with a landing page and a checkout page. Uh, so when, when people filled out this uh, survey, like they were expecting it to uh, come out like, maybe a month or something later, but I just immediately sent them the, the, the website to test if they would actually want to pay for it. And they did, uh, but I wasn't confident enough uh, to like launch it publicly, like my website and the app. So it was private. So then like less than two weeks later, I got this uh, text from my friend uh, at midnight, your Max Toyber tweeted by your app. Uh, you posted it somewhere. Uh, I was like, yeah, Max Toiber. He's like the second guy that bought my app. Yeah, okay. So, so I clicked on that link, right? 
And turns out, um, yeah, so he tweeted about my app. He put my website there, which I hadn't shared with anyone yet, and said, oh, it's basically Vimium for, for all of Mac OS. And I clicked on this profile, and oh, what? Oh, wrong button. Yeah, apparently he has 50K followers, <laughs> and he made like some of the most, some really popular React libraries, like Start Components, React Boilerplate, and yeah, so this was actually how Home Row was launched because I was afraid of launching and so, so someone did it for me. Uh, so yeah, um, you shouldn't be afraid of failure. You should just launch. Like it, it's ready before you think that you are. Um, uh, you can launch it again. So last month I, I put it on Mac apps, slash r slash Mac apps again. Did it pretty well. Uh, made some sales from it. Uh, yeah. You can launch it again. So I, I think you get the idea now, right? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, you, you shouldn't be afraid of make, launching a shitty app at, at the start because uh, you can always launch it again and again. And each time you do it, you have a better app. Um, and yeah, and this doesn't just apply for uh, making apps and launching them, right? Like I was pretty nervous about giving this talk until I realized if it's shit, I can just give another talk again and another place. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so Product Hunt is kind of like the final boss of all launches if you're making apps, uh, because it's just a lot of traffic. There's a lot of competition. Like you have no idea how many chat GPT apps there are out there I do challenge against and lost to. Uh, but yeah, so it was, I launched it last week. Um, it was doing Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year, where um, basically my, my family, my extended family is in Malaysia. So we, we didn't, and we didn't go back uh, to Malaysia to celebrate. So I was in Singapore with my family, like, and we didn't do that much. So I had a lot of free time. So I thought like, uh, screw it, right? Let's just launch a brown hunt this time. I finally have some time. So I, I, I learned how to edit videos in Final Cut. It took me a day. I thought it would, I thought it would take me longer. So I kind of surprised myself there. So I thought like, why not just launch it the next day? And I had to rush a bit. And yeah, so it, it did pretty well. But yeah. Yeah. So even though it was uh, it was the tenth product of the day, which isn't super high, um, but tenth is enough to get you featured on the daily on their daily newsletter, and I managed to make uh three hundred fifty dollars in sales in three days. So yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, so making money. So now I assume that you have launched app maybe a couple of times. You have ironed out all your bugs. Now it's time to make some money. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I just want to emphasize you shouldn't be afraid of asking for money. Uh, that was my main pro the pro main problem that I had. I was afraid of failure. I was I, I didn't think I was competent enough. Um. I, what else? <laughs> yeah, okay. I didn't feel like my app was worth the money. Uh. So I made the app 2019 and I only asked for money in 2022. And I didn't even like launch it right. It was like someone launched it for me. So I just want to emphasize, right? You should value your work, right? Especially work that you spend your free time working after school or after your internship, after your full-time job. You should value your work and you should charge for money even if you're scared of it. So, and you shouldn't, you should charge money as soon as possible. Uh, if you want to make an app that makes money, you, you need to validate that it makes money. And you probably read online like a bunch of like stupid startup books, uh, zero to one, uh, blue oceans, whatever. Like, oh, you should do this product market fit test. You should send your users this MPS survey, uh, send your users this superhuman product market fit survey. Those will never validate that users will pay for it. The only way that users, you, you can validate that users will pay for it is if they pay for it. So start charging money or allow your users to give you money in some way as soon as possible. So on the technical side of things, um, I'll just go through this. Uh, you need to process payments. So you're probably, what, what are you thinking of right now? Like what to process payment? Probably Stripe, right? No, we shouldn't use Stripe. Uh, <laughs> you should use uh, a merchant of record type of payment processor um, because with Stripe, you need to handle taxes, 
and file them and all that. I, I don't know the first thing about tax. I didn't take like POA in secondary school or whatever. Um, and you, you want to focus on building, right? You want to focus on making your app great, not figure out like VAT or whatever European tax uh, compliance thing. So use MRS because they handle tax compliance for you and you pay a higher fee. But if you're making $0 right now, who cares about higher fees, right? Anything that you make is is more than zero zero dollars, yeah. So so what what should you use? That I I've only used two. There are definitely more, but I'll just recommend. Okay, Gumroad. The so Gumroad is. Uh, they, they were recently uh caught some controversy because they raised their fees to ten percent per transaction, um. But yeah, again, shouldn't worry about fees. So I, I recently I was recording a lot of videos to um produce some marketing videos for my landing page. And what a problem that I had was that I needed to minimize all my windows and I had to delete all the files on my desktop. So I thought, what was there a way to like make this easier? So I made this app called Stash in like one day. Um, it was like a Saturday, a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't want to charge money for it because it was very bad. And I, I still don't have time to really fix a lot of the main bugs, but I decided to just put it up anyway. Um, yeah, so I put it up on this uh, website and payment processor called Gumroad. Uh, so it lets you like write markdown files. So this is basically your landing page, right? So you send people to Gumroad. You don't need to make your own landing page and integrate a payment processor with it. Um, then you can uh, set a price. So it can be a fixed price. You can get users to pay you. Then they will Gumroad will email your, your paid users the app. But what I chose was rather than making it free, you can actually make set it to a pay what you want pricing. So the user has to explicitly key in the price that they want to pay. So if you made something people want, they might donate money to you. Uh, yeah, so far I've only had people that I know buy it from me. Uh, so I don't know about the effectiveness, but you can give this a try. Um, but the cool thing about Gumroad is that it helps you collect email addresses. So even if you're making a free app, um, and you want to collect email addresses because you want to have a way to communicate and deliver information or a new app or whatever to your user. So let's say you started charging money for it. You can tell your users, hey, um, it's now paid. You should pay up. Um, um, Pedal. So for my landing page, like for my main app, Homebro, uh, I, I, I didn't use Gumroad. I had my own landing page. So I had to do some integration. So this is what it looks like. It, it's pretty well integrated, but it's just a bit slow, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so it's quite slow. I, I don't know why, but yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, yeah, so, so after a user made a purchase, it makes a call to my uh, license server. Then I generate a license server. Then I use SendGrid to email the, the, the license key to my users. Uh, I, unfortunately, I had to write my own license server because uh, there are not there are no pre-built solutions out there if you want to sell yearly licenses to users. Yep, could you, next slide. Is this, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so before I close out this talk, um, I'll just summarize what I've talked about. Right. Uh, if I were to start a project in twenty twenty three, and I, if I wanted to make money from it. I will solve my own problems because you know yourself best, you know what you want and better than what someone else's want. You should launch quickly uh, to validate your idea and validate that people want it. You should charge quickly to validate that people will actually want to pay money for it. Don't work on something that no one wants to pay money for. Unless you do. And once you got, you, you launch your app, you got users, Improve the product based on your vision and based on what your customers tell you. And you can launch again and again and again, as I've shown previously. And each time you launch, you get better at it. Uh, you get a better product, you get better copywriting, and you learn how to edit videos in Final Cut. Yeah. And split your time, right? You can't just code all the time. Like once you get users, they will start asking you for, for bugs. For, for, they will ask, ask you for features, they will report bugs. So you should probably reply to their emails. Um, 
And marketing, by marketing, I, I don't run any ads, but marketing here in this case means uh, updating your landing page, uh, ensuring that it, is, it reflects what is actually in your app, right? So each time you update your app, you release an update, you sh should probably block out some time to update your web page or your documentation. Okay, so um, some of you probably are starting to come up with excuses like, what, what, like I'm too tired after school or I have work, I need to balance uh, my time. I, I have like, I want to spend time, I want, I want to do, I want to watch TikTok after my school. Um, I don't have time to do it. And I just have three things to say, four things actually to say regarding this. First, uh, the, it should come easy. The, the idea and the work should excite you. Um, if you want it, you'll find the energy to do it. You'll, you'll, you'll block out the time to do it. Um, people can work like eight to 12 hours on their main job. But if for something that is non-essential, right, I think you'll find it really hard to do it and sustain it if you don't enjoy it. So pick an idea that you like um, and you should enjoy the process like coding, uh, doing marketing, etc. There's a bit of pushing yourself, but it should generally feel easy. Um, then next, what are you willing to give up? So for me, when I started my current job, um, I came home at around seven o'clock. I eat dinner at seven thirty. Then I just sat on the couch and like watch YouTube shorts and, until I fall asleep. So when when I wanted to work on home row and make money off of it, the answer is very simple. Just turn off my phone and work on a project until 10 o'clock, then uh, go to sleep. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, mm, also I just want to elaborate a bit more on the first point. Um, when, when I started working on home row again, uh, I was using the old code base. So I, I just forked the open source project. I made it private. I added some features. Then I started charging money for it. Um, but it was very difficult for me. It was very miserable because the code base I wrote when I didn't know how to program, right? So I had to extend it. I had to figure out like all the things that, all the decisions that I made in the past. It was very hard to add features and it made me miserable, right? I tried all kinds of tricks, right? Like uh, I, after work, I went to the library, I shut off my phone and, and I did all that. It just didn't work until um, I finally decided to rewrite the app in um, a new code base with better programming, like, skills that I had now, and it's a much more enjoyable process now. Um, do distracting work when you're distracted. So if you are feeling distracted, you have like one or two hours, you can't get into flow to do, um, like a, to, to work out a very tough programming problem. Like maybe just don't do it now, right? Do it on the weekends or something, or when you have like a big chunk of time to work on. Like you can maybe just go on Twitter and reply to what users are asking. Uh, put out some tweets, do some marketing, reply to some emails, and yeah, you should should do that. <laughs> and lastly, it may not be the right time for right now, um, but it may be in the future. So um, in 2020 and 2021, uh, it was during like COVID. Uh, I had an internship. So like after work, I just really didn't feel like um, working on this project. I I've tried like a couple of times, but a lot of times actually, and but it just didn't work. It just didn't come to me. And yeah, so maybe you might have some other issues you need to work out before you start working on your new project. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're serious about this, uh, let me give you a challenge. So how many of you here are year one? Year one. Cool. How many of you here are doing Orbital this summer? Orbital? No? Okay. Um, okay, but... Year one, I, I don't know if you are, you are, you'll be getting an internship for year one. I, I think a lot of people struggle with it. But you, so you probably have a lot of free time. So what I employ you to do is to, if you're in CVW, pick a project that you think can make money and just work on it over the summer. If you're not in CVW, just do the same. I only have two rules here. You must sell a, a software or info product over the internet. So you can't, and you can't sell to your friends. You have to sell to strangers only. Uh, if you want, you can pair up with a friend. It doesn't matter. Pair up with two friends. Like, it should be fun, right? Uh, so, so, you, you sh so if you're doing Orbital, maybe don't pick a project just to explore some technology, right? Maybe start to think of, about what problems you have, you're currently facing, or maybe your friends are facing, and think about how you can make money from it. And... Yeah, let me know if 
you've completed this challenge, even if you failed. Uh, Thirty dollars over the summer isn't isn't a lot. Okay, it, it, it is a lot of money. Like to, it's very difficult to make your first dollar, but after that, uh, believe me, it's it's much easier to get to thirty dollars. So maybe um your summer is probably like two and a half months. You can spend uh one and a half months just doing the coding, and then the rest you can then you can start to launch and start improving your product and start asking for money. Uh yeah. Uh so. I like to so I hope that this talk has like enlightened you and opened to your eyes to the possibility that you can make money from uh, building software on your own. You don't have to work on a world changing idea. Uh, you don't have to work on a grand idea. You just have to solve a problem. It doesn't have to be a huge problem. Uh, just solve it and solve it well and ask for money. So good luck. Thank you. All right, thanks, Texter. So now we are moving on to our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, sure. Just shout, no, no mic. Yes, um, and they did. Uh, there, there were some people that, uh, there were some like clones that launched, but the thing is they didn't last forever, right? Because this project, like on the surface, it seems pretty simple, like just call the accessibility API, but there's a lot of like little like app specific issues that come up. So the project's actually a lot more complicated than it seems. So the, the, the clone projects that came out, they didn't last that long. Um, I wasn't afraid of competition either because it was open source. It had 3K GitHub stars. It had like, I think 300 daily active users when it was open source. Uh, and I wasn't planning on making money back then. I've given up on that idea at that time. So competition or whatever, it, I thought that I could beat out all the competition by the fact that it's free and it was open source. Um, now, um, now that it's paid and it's closed source, um, I, I obviously I don't have any worries that people are going to steal my current source code, but they can go back and look at the previous source code. I don't really care, right? I've really made enough money where I, I'm okay to quit working on this today. And now I'm just doing it because it's fun. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes. How do I do with software privacy? Uh, I don't. <laughs> like uh, I think yeah. Like don't worry about it until it actually happens, right? Um, um, it's fine. Actually, right, my software, um, even though I have a landing page, um, you don't need a landing page. You don't need to buy a license for me to use the app. So people are, thankfully, they're donating to me. I, I mean, I say it's a paid app, but you don't need to buy the app. Um, in terms, but if I were to like clamp down on the app, I still don't think it's worth your time to uh, chase like one or two uh, people that pirate your software because then like people that don't pay for software are never going to pay for it anyway. So you shouldn't try to convince them otherwise either. Yeah. Like, because you're an indie developer, right? You, you, you need to pick what problems you, you actually want to spend your time on. And like chasing a few uh, imaginary dollars is not what you should be spending your time on. Yeah. No? Yeah. So uh, thanks, Dexter, for giving this a uh, very inspiring talk. So uh, now we'll move on to a 10 minutes break. Um, you guys can go, yeah, 10 minutes and we'll be, have a second session here and there are still pizza outside. So feel free to get some, thanks. Okay, so um, welcome back. So we are starting our second session. Uh, for this session, we are inviting two teams from, the, from this year's Hack and Roll, and they are from the top eight. So now I'm inviting Slap Slap with their project post edif
Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the second half of this talk for today. Uh, I'm Pranati, and with me, I have Vamika, Vishruti, and Aishwarya Singh. And today, we'll be talking about our Hack and Joel 2023 project, which is called Positive. Okay, something's happening. Uh, hold on, guys. <laughs> technical difficulties. Hello? Yeah, okay. Okay, apologies for that. Okay, all right, let's go again. Um, today, we'll be talking about our project that we made for NUS Hack and Roll 2023. I'm Pranati and with me, I have Vishuti, Vamika and Aishwarya. And we are from team Slap Slap. Yes, I know, interesting name, we did not think much about the fact that we'll be giving a talk today when we came up with a name, but I assure you it may, it'll all make sense when we introduce our project to you. All right, next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today. We'll be covering the following topics. And basically we'll be talking about an IoT hardware come software project that we made for Hack and Roll, which is called Positive, and it is a posture detector and corrector. So what was our inspiration behind this, you may ask? Let's see. You see the picture on screen over there? This is our, our view on the hackathon day. We were just looking around. We were like, what do we build today? And then we see all of you guys sitting there with your laptops coding away. We we're like, what is one similarity between all the people present here today? Apart from the fact that we love coding, of course. It's the fact that almost every single person in that picture is slouching. And I can see some people in the audience too. So sit up straight people <laughs> all right okay so of course that was our inspiration for today and sorry for our project and i'll now pass my time to vishuti who'll be talking about the components of the same thanks pranati um <laughs> okay now you can clearly see why we called it slap slap um so our project consists of three main components um a posture detector a slapper and a web app. So uh, you can have a look here. I mean, okay, I'm, my hands are kind of full. This is a posture detector. I know it's kind of chunky right now, but you know, we built this in 24 hours. So yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is the slapper. We also built it in that time frame, So it, it doesn't look great, but it worked. So yeah. Um, basically, the posture detector is designed to be worn on the user's back and it detects bad posture utilizing the data we collected during the course of the hackathon. And haptic feedback is provided in the form of vibrations. So if you're slouching a lot, it's going to vibrate like even more. So you're going to be really, really, really annoyed. OK? Uh, you know, we were going for like the most annoying hack. So that's where we were, came from. But yeah. Um, secondly, the slapper provides tactile and audiovisual feedback. Audio, yes, it comes from a buzzer that is attached to the slapper, so it kind of plays annoying music while it slaps you and tells you to, you know, sit up straight. And um, it also frantically like moves and it's kind of really annoying. And finally, a little less annoying thing is uh, the user can access a comprehensive dashboard in the form of a web app. And it provides real-time statistics and feedback to the user to help them improve their posture. So the web app also provides recommendations on how to help users maintain their habits in the long run. So now Amika will speak about the demo. Thank you, Vishruti. So uh, we'll be showing you a quick video demo first of our uh, system. All right. So here you can see that I have the posture corrector right there, which tilted because you're slouching. And so uh, you can see this vibrating intensely. <laughs> and you can't hear it here, but there was also something playing on the buzzer, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and here's our visualization, which is the application that gives you some sort of statistics on um, how the app is performing and basically how you are performing with your posture. All right. So uh, some technical details, our process and tech stack involve three main components, which is the hardware that you just saw. Then as you can see, the hardware was not 
like the wires were not connected to any particular laptop or server, et cetera. That's because we were using wireless communication. And we also have the web application, which again, you saw in the demo. So let's talk about the hardware first. Um, you might be thinking how with that particular small module or like not that small, um, how are we able to detect your slouch? So that's because we use an IMU, which is basically uh, used to give your orientation in the X, Y, Z plane, as well as the uh, roll pitch here. So we use these values um, to detect your slouch. And we also connected uh, some actuators, which involved the vibration motor, which Vishuti just talked about would vibrate very vigorously. And we also had a second module, as you can see here, um, which consists of our slapper and our buzzer. And for the buzzer, we used a very interesting tune that was coffin dance three times the speed. So um, all in all, the most annoying system that you can ever have. But in the end, it serves the point of correcting your posture. And for communications, we um, communicated via MQTT, which is um, which allows wireless communications because there was a Wi-Fi module in uh, the processor we use, which is a VMOS. A VMOS is basically an Arduino attached with a Wi-Fi module. So um, essentially, we only used uh, Arduino IDE and Python for coding all of this out. Yeah, and the data collection also was done using Python itself. Yep, and now I'll pass it to Ashwarya. Uh, thanks, Vamika. So the web app itself, the backend was built using uh, Flask, and the communication was through the Flask library, uh, Flask uh, MQTT. So all the data that was coming from the server was processed in the backend, and the front end was simple HTML, CSS, JavaScript, which would then like query the backend and get the updated values. So it was all being updated real time on the UI, and the user would also get alert on the browser while they would be working. So it would be a little annoying for sure. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, it's a demo of how the web app itself works. So you can see that uh, there's live data. So as your posture becomes worse, the grade also changes. And so there's also hourly statistics. It stores your posture score for every hour. And uh, we also have um, like demographic based statistics as well. So once you provide your login information, uh, you'll be able to like compare your posture with everyone else um, who has also used the web app. And of course you have recommendations and we had to take pictures, of course. Uh, and it gives you recommendations on how you can improve your posture. So like, if you go back up, you can actually see that every time we moved and we had poor posture or if we had good posture, it would change uh, real time on the web app. And yeah, this is basically how the web app uh, works. All right, thank you, Ashwarya. Now, of course, we took a little bit of advice from Dexter's talk previously. And if we were to monetize this product in the future, of course, we would want to develop it further because what we have right now was built within 24 hours. So we definitely want to slap in a few more features and make it more robust before making it a more holistic product. So we have a few future prospects on the slide right now. Number one would be the cloud deployment of our web application. Of course, right now it was running on a local server um, on one of our laptops and they were all connected to the same network. Now, of course, if you have multiple users in the future, you're gonna to wanna to have multiple instances of the web app running on each user's device and hence give them live updates depending on their data. And hence we'll be hosting our web app on the cloud. Secondly, we wanted to parallelize the hardware processes and make it more efficient and optimized in the sense that right now, the VMOS is basically like an Arduino. So all your functions run in one giant loop, which um, operates serially. So in the future, we would like to use something like a real-time operating system that can parallelize your processes and make it more efficient on the whole. Now, Vamika will talk about the other two prospects. Thank you, Pranati. Um, so as you can see, what's left over is mainly concerning data and recommendations. Uh, now that we had only 24 hours, so you can tell that the amount of data we collected was very little. And so in the future, we hope to provide this to more users. As such, we'll have more data. And with more data, again, big data, machine learning, um, data analytics, right? So who knows, maybe you'll find some very interesting insights on how, um, on what factors affect slouching for different people in different locations, maybe even. 
And with those, we aim to provide some personalized recommendations. Uh, so since it, it'll, it'll become a user-based app, we can have specific data, which is specific to a particular user, and then we can personalize recommendations for them accordingly. Yep. And... Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for listening to us. So thanks, Team Slap Slap. So as usual, we are moving on to our Q&A session. So has does anyone have any question? Please raise your hand. OK, sure. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know. We're, we're all year four students right now, so we're like, you know, going into the workforce. But mm -hmm. I think it's something we could consider. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Once we're settled in our jobs, side hustle maybe. <laughs> Any other questions regarding anything? A live, live demo. demo. Hmm. <laughs> Sometimes, okay, the thing with hardware is, right? <laughs> I'm speaking this as a year four computer engineer. We've looked at too much hardware already. This, okay, we built this in 24 hours with not, not with, you know, long-term things in mind. And sometimes wires come out, things happen. So we're not quite sure what went wrong there, but you know, we, you know, we'll fix it and figure it Guys, out. Guys, it's the battery. <laughs> it's not the battery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's basically it. It's yeah. something must have come out over time. We would have liked to show a live demo, but unfortunately, that was not possible. Um, side note, if anyone knows how to configure WSL settings, please let us know, because <laughs> we would appreciate the help. <laughs> yep. Anything else? <laughs> yep. What's a VMOS? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, you know about Arduino, right? Hobbyist hardware. Yeah, so um, basically we use, uh, the, Arduino is basically a microcontroller. So VMOS is just Arduino um, incorporated with a Wi-Fi module that allows for wireless communication or wireless connection to different devices. Yeah. And just a basic introduction to Arduino. It has a bunch of like input and output ports that you can connect multiple sensors to and kind of just configure them for your hobbyist home-based pro projects. And since it is like pretty like, you know, basic level hardware, um, everything runs in one giant loop. So everything just kind of repeats over and over. Um, so suppose we want to configure multiple sensors, we would like something that's more parallel in nature, which is why our future prospect was addressing that issue and making it more optimal. Yeah. Good question. Actually, we're not, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, none of us are computer science. <laughs> uh, yeah. Computer engineering as well. <laughs> yeah. Also, one of the reasons why we chose to do a hardware hack instead of the standard, like software, completely software based project. Expertise, sort of. Yes, I guess. <laughs> so, does anyone have, have any other questions? So um, thanks for the thanks for Team Slap Slap. Um, uh, we don't have much time, so we'll just move on to Team Toxic Vapor. Okay. Um, hi guys. Uh, evening everyone. Um, we are be your own mobile carrier. Um, I'm Solomon. Uh, this is Tia Fong, and we are Team uh, Toxic Vapor. So uh, just a quick introduction of us. Uh, Toxic Vapor is actually a larger group of people, but many of them couldn't make it, so it's just the two of us. Uh, this time round. I'm Solomon. I'm uh, triple E in NTU. Uh, Tiafong is MACS and we are both year four. Um, in our free time, we like to do a lot of funny things. Um, a lot to talk about, but not much time. But essentially, the, the most relevant of it is uh, this particular con uh, topic called amateur radio, which is kind of like what we did for this particular hackathon. And we'll, I'll be going to more details about that. Yeah, so this, this, this is us doing some amateur radio stuff together. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so um, before I talk about our particular project, just to give you guys some background about why we did what we did. And when you talk about internet connectivity, you, the first thing you think of is Wi-Fi. More, more or less, usually that's the case, right? You have your 2.4 gigahertz, you have your 5 gigahertz, and you know that the higher frequency usually provides a higher data rate than the one, the, the lower frequency, but the lower frequency one can provide higher coverage uh, than the former, right? But no one actually thinks uh, about the connectivity infrastructure that comes into play that connects uh, your devices, your wireless devices to the internet. And all these are done by, for example, uh, cellular towers or fiber optic cables and everything that brings all your devices and all your servers together into one large network of networks. And from this particular image, you can see two issues. Uh, one of it is, uh, which we don't experience in Singapore at least, is that the rural areas would have a lack of internet connectivity because it's just so expensive to establish all the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that you need to provide internet access. And the second thing is, again, we don't experience it in Singapore, is if there is an, a disaster, for example, and it knocks out even one or two key infrastructure pieces, then you lose your internet connection, right? And this is something that, for example, other countries experience, like Puerto Rico, they had an earthquake, or was it a hurricane? I forgot which one, but essentially they are, Infrastructure got knocked down and they lost internet connectivity. And when you and, and in today's society, you know, internet connectivity is very important. You want to keep in contact with your friends and family. And then without infrastructure, you're unable to do so. So how then are you able to connect with your friends and family? Now you can't use government infrastructure because they use it for emergency services. So there's something less well known called amateur radio, which is just a bunch of amateurs coming together and they have their radio equipment and they set up different zones in different areas and say, okay, this zone will be uh, coordinated by this particular frequency and everyone will get to communicate with each other. So you don't have your broadband communication, so not fast enough to stream your Netflix, but enough to let your friends and family know that, they are, that you are okay and you know, for them to let you know that they are okay. So uh, this is a very well-known uh, uh, situation that happened in Puerto Rico back in 2017 that uh, major news outlets were sharing about how amateur radio operators help provide the connectivity where it's needed. So um, we thought about it, how can we do something that's related to, you know, some uh, a hackathon and something that's related to modern day technology. Now when you think uh, amateur radio, the problem with amateur radio is that most people usually think of a lot of radio equipment, maybe one computer here and there, but a lot of radio equipment that you need a lot of expertise to set up and use. And that is not something that we, uh, or at least a normal person is familiar with. So we thought, why not have something that will be able to provide a longer range connectivity for you to communicate with your friends and it's something that's essentially a uh, plug and play. Like for example, the Wi-Fi dongle that you are familiar with when you want to have uh, better connectivity to your Wi-Fi router from maybe outside your home. So uh, before, <laughs> before I explain exactly what, uh, what we did in particular, you might be familiar with some of these uh, wireless solutions, Bluetooth for your short uh, range ones, and then your LoRa and Zigbee, some of you might have come across it for your IoT. But because it's for IoT, it's not really that useful in our particular case. Although we did something similar before in 2020 for Hack and Roll, but uh, unfortunately that one we didn't win. <laughs> so this was our project goal, very simple, which is uh, we want it to be cheap, not like the usual radio stuff that the amateur radio operators will be using, something that is easy to use, plug and play, uh, decently long range, and has a decent speed. So you can send email and whatnot. You know, not to stream your Netflix or whatnot. So this was essentially what we had in mind. So you saw the, the Wi-Fi dongle previously, and you know that it's just essentially a radio, uh, it, it transmits something out at 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, right? Instead of that, we just changed the radio segment to something else that will transmit it on a slightly lower frequency, which we'll get to that in just a second. But this is the, the overall architecture. You want to mention the other? Yeah. So what we, okay, so 
So what we did was that we realized that there are actually two USB ports down here. So previous solutions really like to use a serial port for some weird, weird reason. I don't know why. Like you have to use a very specialized application. You have to use a very slow serial port. You have to set up this, set up that. So we realized that because this microcontroller has actually a USB, like a physical USB a logic block on it, we can actually just make it look like a USB to Ethernet adapter. Then everything will just work out of the box without you like trying to mess around with random software. Uh, pass around with, with random software. So this is what we did. Uh. So we use a USB port and it does look like an Ethernet adapter. So because of the fact that we are it looks like Ethernet adapter, like it can work on like Windows, Mac OS, Linux without any like inbuilt drivers. No, I mean without any external drivers. Just plug and play. And the thing is that everything above like TCP, everything just works exactly as it should. There is no modification needed. So what we only changed was like the first and second uh, layer. So what we did was to, when we receive an Ethernet frame, we just package it so that it can be sent over the air. Then we just send to the SI4463 to transmit it over the air. That way that like if everything is just done as is, there's really no need to uh, add additional complexity and uh, make, make it very difficult. Yeah, so it's a hack job, don't be toy this. It's just a glue layer between the computer OS and the radio module. Um, yeah, so, so once, it, once it sends the Ethernet frame, you just send it out over the air. But the future work is basically that we need to modify it for wireless operation. There's already like a bit of code where you wait for the channel to be clear before sending. But uh, because of like time constraints, we didn't really have a lot of time to uh, implement the CSMACA, which basically to like stop sending and wait for a random amount of time before you uh, send it out. So when you see that this one about like waiting for a random amount of time, this is basically waiting for the radio itself to finish sending, not waiting for the radio, waiting for the channel to clear. Yeah, the, the physical layer is uh, just called the SI446X because we use the specific version, it's the SI4463, which allows us to put it at like 433 megahertz. Uh, it's you see that it's four hundred thirty three megahertz, it's like much like six times lower, like one six of two point four gigahertz. That is what's allowed it to propagate really far. There are options to work at like nine hundred fifteen megahertz and hundred and forty four megahertz, but uh, like for four three three nine hundred fifteen is like a bit. I don't think it's it's very good to use because I'm I'm not really sure about the regulations, but four three three is one of the most clear thing to use, and. The 144 megahertz part is a bit difficult to get, so we didn't do it. And you see the bandwidth is really low, it's 10 kilohertz. We chose it because this is easier to debug and for the time and for the timing in hack and roll. And but the thing is that it's actually you can set it between a 10 kilohertz to like uh like maybe 500 kilohertz or something like this. So we can al always like change the data link layer to make it faster, make it slower. But the power is 100 milliwatts and it's only because of like our equipment limitations. Because we all have, well, both of us have a license, an amateur radio license. We are actually uh, legally limited to like 10 watts if you really wish to scale it up. And 10 watts is probably enough to, uh, 10 watts is probably enough to like cover half the island of Singapore or something if we are on a tall enough HDB. <laughs> Maybe even the entire island, we are not very sure. We don't have a 10 watt radio to, to tell. But yes, this shows the potential of like having a, using a lower frequency to get longer range. And not only that, we also designed a, a PCB, so PCB, because the current uh, module on the breadboard only allows us to, hun to do 100 milliwatts and the PCB, and the, and the PCB we have has this, this module, this metallic module that, that amplifies up to one watt so that like, we can try with a higher, power output and then maybe we can see like what kind of new possibilities we can get when we like 10x the power output and stuff like this. So we have fapped it now here, it's, it has arrived and it's not populated, but we hope to populate it uh, in, your, in the near future. So the usage potential will be to, okay, for a hack and roll, we just did a simple point to point network. And definitely there are users for like wireless mesh networking. So I think ARE-DN already does it. But what we are more excited about is this thing called the Batman ADV, where there's an existing solution where you take any data link layer, 
and it will just add its own protocol over it to make it a, become a mesh network. Even Batman ADV works even over like Ethernet or something like this. So we could definitely just attach Batman ADV on it to make a, a gigantic mesh network if you really wanted. Okay, so now we provide some additional ideas for you guys, you know, whenever hackathons or whatnot, or if you want to start your own business, you can get one of these ideas as well. So amateur radio, even though it's by right very hardware based, very electro uh, electrical engineering based, um, in the modern day and age, it's moving towards software. And the term you might have heard a couple of times maybe is called software defined radio, which if you're familiar with radio itself, you have your whatever electrical components inside it, you implement it in software instead of having the actual electrical components. So essentially, as CS or CEG undergrads, you're essentially stealing the electrical engineer's job as well. So essentially making me jobless, lah, so to speak. I mean, that's why I'm <laughs> here. Okay, so what can you possibly do if you are familiar with F uh, FPGAs? You can use these things to implement your electrical logic gate. So you can use your general purpose CPUs as well um, to implement what you call uh, digital signal processing algorithms. Um, it's a one big long topic on itself. I think some of you, I think NUS will have a couple of mods on that. So if you guys are interested, you can go and figure, you can sign up for those modules and then try to figure out how you can manipulate different signals to demodulate or modulate and so on. Um, there is a heavy em emphasis on embedded systems as well. So just to give an example of a project that we did with a group of other amateur radio operators in Singapore. So what we did was, we have a radio module with a, uh, I can't remember if an Arduino or ESP32. We put it in an uh, uh, insulated box and we had a big balloon which we sent up to about 10 kilometers up in the atmosphere. So it's a weather balloon. We measure the temperature, the, the pressure up in the high up in the atmosphere. And we use something as simple as this. And then using our amateur radio licenses, we uh, essentially broadcast it down to where we are, and then we can, you know, we, we can study the atmosphere in Singapore, like, essentially. And in addition to that, uh, what we did was we had an additional camera on board. So what you can see down here, although it's very flaky because it's sent via analog, so it's very noisy, is an image of the sky above Singapore. You can see a bit of the clouds and the, and the ground at the bottom as well. So other, th other I ideas that you could do for hackathons or a business is to implement something, maybe some additional compression algorithm or, or, or image or video codec, something that is different from the usual web or app-based applications, you know, that most CS people will be familiar with. But it's not to say that you cannot do that because that's what we did as well. So for the balloon project, when we set up the balloon, right, we had, we created a website uh, that we hosted uh, that would track uh, the location of the balloon. So as it transmits its data down, we keep track of its location and, we, and then we plotted it on cesium ion, so cesium GS. And then as each additional data point comes in, we plot its path out. So we have like a 3D path of where our balloon flew. So we started off in like West Coast and then it flew over, uh, this is West Malaysia already essentially. So, and, and another project, this one uh, was done solely by Tiet Fong. Uh, it's a web SDR project, which is essentially turning your web browser into a radio. So, a ra so your web browser will be the one that will demodulate and modulate uh, the signals and then to, you can hear whatever you know, radio signal is coming up. I mean, as, as far as it is, it's really decent already. And if you guys are interested, you guys can actually uh, look at the link and then, you know, just take a look at the, pro uh, at the project that we did. It's incomplete. Uh, we didn't want to launch it. We didn't want to monetize it either. <laughs> I guess this counts as a product launch. <laughs> yeah. So, the, uh, some, uh, if you guys are ambitious and more into network protocol design, you guys could actually come in the amateur radio and also, you know, implement new protocols that you guys might want to. If you are curious, you can Google something like FTA and APRS, their digital signals, and then people actually implemented these uh, new protocols to allow people to communicate with each other. 
And if this interests you, so some shameless advertisement here, um, and you guys want to get licensed or just to know more, you can uh, Google this thing called uh, Singapore Amateur Radio Transmitting Society. For a reason, it's not called Singapore Amateur Radio Society because SARS doesn't sound very auspicious. Uh, but so if you guys are interested you, uh, to get licensed, you need to take an MCQ exam. So it's nothing as hard as the usual module exam. Or you can just ask your phone and I about how to get involved. If you have an electrical engineering degree or something, I think you get uh you can get exempted for one of the exams. Yeah, but I mean you can do it. Yeah. And, and also like if I if you're a student you get like I don't know fifty percent of the exam fee or something like this. Yeah. So just do it while you're a student. Mm -hmm. So you guys can use your software skills to make the, the hobby a little bit better, like and use it for your hackathon ideas. So thank you for your attention. Any uh Q and A you guys have? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the value balloon. Uh, what happens is that as it goes up, right, the the pressure pressure of the atmosphere decreases, so it's the the value balloon get bigger and bigger. I heard it goes up to like five meters or about two meters. Diameter. Yeah, diameter. Like yeah, it's like very large in diameter. And it bursts, and then you can track the balloon slowly falling down. So one of the balloons actually did that. Like, it popped over Malaysia. And a, a friend of a friend of ours got like his friend in Malaysia to retrieve it. But like for some weird reason, I think like what yeah, one of the one of the career just lost it for some reason and, and then people are like now now what it's like so close yet so far. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the reasons why we classified it as a weather balloon. Because legally speaking, you cannot send something across international borders. <laughs> unless it's a weather balloon. Yeah. And NEA, NEA puts like two of these balloons every day, if I'm not wrong. Uh, our official position is that we are not affiliated with anything about that balloon. <laughs> well, I, we, our project was supposed to be about our Wi-Fi dongle, then I become about the yeah, it seems like you're quite interested in the balloon project. But yeah, sure, we know quite a bit about it, so we can talk about it. Uh, well, uh, that one you need to ask the main, like, you know, the, the principal project manager to come here, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah okay, sure, sure, I'll do that. Okay, so about this, like, right, if I'm not wrong, we first started during the COVID season where there wasn't, like, a lot of aeroplanes and stuff flying around. So... I think I think that's why IMDA or like CAS gave like approval, not not approval. They gave the okay to to put the balloon up there. So that's like one thing. The other thing is that we need to make sure that uh our balloon fits within the regulation or something. Like this. Like it must be at most at two meters or something. It cannot be too tall. Cannot be too too big or something like this. Then it fit in. And the other problem is that because it's helium, you know, helium balloons don't lift a lot. You need to make sure that your electronics are light enough and small enough to like actually fly up or else you will just never get off the ground. So these are like, there's like, there's like a lot of weird issues about like, you know, the packaging is shave off a bit to get the extra few grams off or something like this. <laughs> and then there's funny things that like you go up, the, the, the battery gets too cold. And then you need to put a heater on board to make sure the battery still performs well and stuff like this. Like what, what, I think the first balloon failed because like, no, maybe, was it the second? I think the second balloon failed. Yeah, no, the second balloon failed because like it got too cold and then we didn't expect it to run our battery this fast. So I think it was still flying, like going towards the Pekanbaru area in, to Indonesia, then it just lost connection and we couldn't really figure out what, what, what's going on afterwards. Huh? Yeah. Okay, good, good question. Finally, one about the project. <laughs> so the ESP32 is actually just uh, like a data transport layer between the radio module itself and the computer. So 
you see the USB is actually like, it actually acts as a USB to Ethernet device. So if you plug in, you just show that, oh, this is a new network. And then there will be an internal DHCP server to as assign you IP. Uh, how, how this works is that if it detects uh, like a DHCP packet, you will just route to its inner server and just, uh, and just, send, and just send it back. But if it doesn't detect like, the DHCP packet or like it just detects that this packet is supposed to send out into it, you will just go through the SP all these wires, go inside the chip and tell it to transmit off to the air. So it's just like a glue layer between the computer and the air. And, and plus, I mean, we only had 24 hours and then most of the time we were walking around exploring the school and... Uh, uh, no, there was no such thing. We were talking with friends, yeah, and enjoying the good games that NUS hackers organized for us. So that's why it's, we had to cut corners like a good Chinese engineering company. <laughs> so that, that's why we had this. Yeah. Uh, okay, we didn't, we didn't test the range of this one. Because, I mean, we can't possibly show someone that we test the range. I mean, either he or I will have to disappear somewhere. And then when the judge says, where's the other person you're testing? You have to, you know, trust me, bro, kind of thing. <laughs> so, but we did our own test before with, like, our other radio equipment. And, and, and uh, the range we got was, I think, about 5, 6 km. Yeah, I think it's a walkie-talkie, and then we just talk to each other over it. And then the longest one we've got was like, I think someone was at SUTD and I was at like some top building orchard and we managed to get like a legible conversation of it. So this is what, this is what like inspired us to, instead of just talking over it and then like we just talk about our IP addresses and, and the hacks, we just talk hacks over the thing. Why not we just set a computer to talk hacks over the air instead? No, uh, it's, Okay, line of sight definitely helps a lot, but because the the frequency is low enough that you don't need too much line of sight, you can also do funny tr stuff like bounce your waves off a building or something like this. But it's not as line of sight as uh, as you think it is as Wi Fi basically. That's why we 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 decided to do this. Yeah. and this this mic is like five hundred megahertz, which we. It says 529 megahertz there, which we don't have a license to transmit on, so. <laughs> yes, interesting. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're running out of time, so uh, thanks, Toxic Vapor. There's one more thing happening, that is to, uh, Chris is actually going to hand over some raffle prizes of the advent of code, so. Uh, all right. Okay, hi everyone. So uh, my name is Chris and I'm a core team member of NUS Hackers. So uh, I'm not sure if, if you guys have, are aware, but uh, over the last uh, December, we actually ran this uh, advent of code thing. So yeah, this is actually the first time I'm able to like perform this raffle to like a live audience. So very happy about that. But I, I just wanted to give a quick background about this. So. Okay, Advent of Code is not affiliated with NUS Hackers. It's just this um, programming challenge that people do for fun every December. So it, it follows the Advent calendar. It starts from December 1st, and then you just like do one problem a day until December 25th. So there are a lot of people in the world, right? They're actually like, they're just too, too damn bored, and they just want to like solve some problems. And then they just like do this during like December. And, I, and trust me, there's really a lot of people who are so free. And... So in 2020, like I was like just like solving this thing on my own, right? And then like it was just for fun. Uh. And I thought that there were a number of my friends who also liked solving such problems. So I thought, well, why not we just create a community, gather the people in like Singapore who wanted to have a community to just solve these problems together, uh, to discuss the solutions, discuss anything that they might get stuck with, and and yeah, and, and that's what I did. So like we just like with the help of NUS hackers, we just like uh, um, formed this community. And then over the past few years, we decided to make it more exciting because this is something that completely, okay, not really, I wouldn't say completely, but it aligns with our, the NUS hackers vision. We wanted to spread hacker culture. We wanted to encourage people to do things for fun and because they like doing things, right? So this was something that aligned with that. We wanted to like build this community to like 
uh, spread this cycle culture. And so uh, we actually decided to throw in some goodies. So the this is the deal, right? Every day that you solve, this is 25 days, every day you, if you solve both stars, then you'll get like two stars. So you actually only need to solve 10 days and then you'll get 20 stars. So as long as you get 20 stars and above, okay, uh, you will qualify for like a chance to win like a $10 food delivery voucher. And there will be 15 winners today. Okay, so yeah, so uh, all they had to do is they just needed to like join the NUS hackers uh, private leaderboard. So these are all the people who joined. Uh, I think there's around 300 people in the leaderboard. Okay, like if you were following like our publicity channels, you have received the code to join this uh, leaderboard. And if you did soft 20 stars and above, you'll be able to qualify for this raffle, right? Okay, so these are the list of uh, 87 people who actually are able to qualify for the raffle. So you might see your names there. Okay, can I have a show of hands whose name is actually here and you actually qualify for the raffle? Just raise your hands. Wow, actually nobody. That's amazing. Okay, well, great. Then now you guys actually know that we have such a thing that, that is running, right? So, right. So there's time for the draw. There's 87 people who completed the challenge. And there's 15 lucky winners that will win a $10 food delivery voucher. And we are actually just like 30 minutes before today's 12 million total draw. But the thing is, look at this, right? You have way higher odds of actually winning like a, anything out of this. So yeah, um, don't gamble and buy total. Instead, gamble and join ever or code, right? <laughs> okay. Wait, how many? Okay. Right, so uh, over here you see this tool for the Ever or Code draw. Uh, it was actually repurposed from Hack and Roll. So during Hack and Roll, actually one of our very talented volunteers uh, called Si Yuan, he actually made like uh, a raffle tool and I kind of just adapted it for this tool. So yeah, just, you know, like, like yeah, just giving due credit for like who made this amazing tool. So we're going to start drawing 15 names, right? The next 15 names you see here will be people who win like $10 food delivery vouchers and let's go. Okay, and first we have Audrey. Audrey won ten dollar vouchers. Okay, next we have uh this person who has a handle called Shmova. Right. Okay. All these are like GitHub handles or like Reddit handles or anything. So it might look a bit random, but we'll contact the winners afterwards. And T T T Y Y Z Z Z. Next, fourth one we have Kang Chen. Okay, then the fifth one we have T Ren Jing. Sixth one we have Gabriel I L I W L M. Is it seven? Seven? Right, seven we have Arif Khalid. Then next, the eight we have Sean 185. Ninth, we have Nicholas Fu. Then we have Rero, Rero, because he's a core team member. <laughs> okay, uh, then we have Hao Jie. Next, we have 11, we have Bryce. 12, we have Ryan Ong. 13, we have Wong Zizi. 14, we have, yes, this person. <laughs> 15, we have Tan Jin Wei. Right, so can we just have me count if there's 15 in total? <laughs> okay, right, so yeah, that concludes the end of today's draw. If any of them um, do not respond to the survey form, which I will send out afterwards to get their contact details, uh, we will roll another winner. But yeah, that's, that concludes today's draw. But yeah, I just wanted to end off and say that yeah, um, here at NUS Hackers, we're always like supporting such initiatives. So for example, if, if you guys have any ideas of like any um, hackerish events that you think we could support, or if you want to organize such events, um, feel free to, to let us know what your ideas are. And in fact, core team is also recruiting now. So if you are an NUS student who wants to be empowered to make such events possible for like a 
hackers within NUS and in Singapore in general. Yeah, we are recruiting now and feel free to like uh, join us. Yep. Right, that's all for today. Right, back to you. Thanks, Chris. Sorry. All right, before you leave, uh, again, a big shout out to our sponsor, Jane Street, for sponsoring the food. And um, here is the feedback form. So we appreciate all your feedbacks and we learn from from feedbacks and yeah, we hope to make Friday Hacks better. And uh, also we are having Hacker Tools next Tuesday. It's about shell and scripting. So if you are interested, please uh, do sign up. And the sign up links are in the Telegram channel. So if you have not joined, please join. Okay, so that's all for today. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, yeah, next week we have more hack and roll teams. So if you guys uh, want to see uh, want to see some cool hacks, yeah, please come by. Yeah.